it's Jared O'Dee here. I'm with Alex Hunter, one of our most popular and experienced trainers here at Dynamis. And today I specifically want to talk to him about the personal resilience course that he runs and the reasons behind it and what kind of content he covers on it. So welcome, Alex. Hiya. I know that you've had you know really good results from this course, but maybe we could start at the beginning. How did you get to a place in your training career where you're delivering a personal resilience course? If we look back to my career as we go through the military and the security, um, a lot of high impact events, uh, which is part for the course of, as the, of the job, and then culminating at that point when it comes to the training with a murder a venue I was looking after, and then having to keep 30 staff or reasonably on track and let, give them some coping strategies to be able to move forward. Um, I've been interested in psychology for since about 2005 as a one of those things where I've just gone down the rabbit hole and just kept going and kept going and kept going. And uh, the interesting part for me was, you know, we we teach conflict management to people who are front facing, who are public facing, who are dealing with service users, clients. But what we don't do is equip them for the conflict within themselves. Um, we talk about a social contract all the time, about how we behave amongst others. But what we don't t talk about enough is a self-contract, where we set some standards and boundaries with ourselves of what is acceptable and where we're going to draw the line on getting help and who we're going to go to to get that help from. And uh, one of the things about, uh, especially Western culture, is there's a lot of embarrassment around going to get help. So it's trying to break down that so people have a coping strategy where they can feel good for making themselves feel good, if that sounds all right. Somebody might be a real giver, you know, real care, caring personality like we see all the time in healthcare and we see it in social care and we see it in all the allied professions around that is you have people who really want to look after people and they want to look after other people and sometimes they just forget that they need to put as much energy and thought into how they look after themselves especially when they're dealing with difficult situations yeah, when we when we do health and safety training <clears throat> one of the key things we talk about is that your first duty of care is to yourself but by their very nature people who care will externalize and care about others first and the issue i find with that is that a phrase that i was always taught was to take care of others you must first take care of yourself and if you don't do that then eventually it probably not intentioned that way, but you will spill across if you've not taken care of yourself and you have issues that then spill across to your the, the people you're caring for, whether they're um, you know children, foster children, children in school, um, certainly patients in a hospital, then all that's going to happen is your ability to deliver what you would feel good delivering as a service is going to diminish. And then you enter these spirals and these these psychological traps where you feel bad for having done something and then that just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. So you erode per performance. And one of the things I've, I've found with clinicians, especially those coming into the, um, the sort of medical field, having spent years studying, is that their study doesn't give them the specific tools to be able to cope with that transition from being a student who goes out and practices with a mentor to suddenly being a clinician, you know, and and the massive pressure that's heaped upon them, which happens in many different professions, but certainly I, when it comes to healthcare, you are essentially in charge of someone else's life. Um, specifically with midwives, you're in charge of two lives, and they're not they're not given the skill set to be able to cope with that, to remain almost. <clears throat> true to themselves in a way and that it's one of those phrases that's quite bandied about these days but if I can't take care of myself away from work then that will eventually no matter how professional I am spill over into work and when someone has a balance between their life outside of work and work then you tend to see them chop away the work first you know mm. it, the job's doing this to me so I'm going to quit sort of thing Interesting. So, you know, when we teach conflict management skills to staff, we're generally trying to help them to feel that they can cope in difficult situations with others, yeah. that they have tools that they can apply and make their workplace safe in that respect. So in respect of other people. 
but I'm sure there's so much that we could be doing to help people to deal with their own internal dialogue about what's happening to them as well, right? Well, absolutely, because <clears throat> if I if I don't have a self contract, a set of standards that I see for myself as to how I'm going to behave, how I'm going to behave with certain people, what I'm willing to accept in certain circumstances and what I'm not. Um, and this is always an interesting thing because most people don't articulate that to themselves. They just carry on uh, in life and just carry on with this whole, well, it's just me, it's who I am, etc. But when you get them to actually look at their behavior in response to you know, the stress at work today and what they've done as a coping mechanism when they got home. Was it a healthy one? Did they go home and eat a whole cake? Because that gave them pleasure, taste buds, calorie rush, and raised their sugar levels. And then six weeks down the line, they said, you know, they're feeling depressed because they gained a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. All these, all these things when you see, and the, if I don't have that stated self contract, then I'll step outside of what I should and shouldn't do and then before i before anything else i'll probably do myself some harm um maybe not physiologically but certainly psychologically because guilt and regret are those two things that, that keep hitting you all the time um i like to call it a woulda coulda shoulda right so you know especially as an overthinker I'm, there are things running through my head from last year <laughs> there are things running through my head you know from 10 years ago when i could have said something or done something and it's not always the most serious context either because people do this all the time. And as they're doing it, especially if they, they have a high pressure or a job that means that they have lives on, you know, in their care, that woulda, coulda, shoulda can repeat and repeat and repeat. And when we look at it, certainly from a, a sort of a chemical level, um, we, we have to deal with people and talk about adrenaline a lot. Mm. If you've got constant little bursts of adrenaline because you're, you're overanalyzing things, you get this thing called analysis paralysis where you just keep going over and over and you're essentially torturing you, yourself, you know? And I think you've worked with that particular section of staff quite quite uh, consistently. Is that the staff who are coming into clinical practice, they've spent a lot of time in academia and maybe being mentored and that now they're doing clinical practice themselves and they're starting to feel that pressure. You know, what are the specific things that you help them with? What models do you give them to start helping them deal with their stress and so on? I mean, you just mentioned that self-contract. I'm sure that is pretty important. Well, um, the first thing to do is to, to acknowledge that everyone in the room needs to be fully honest with themselves. Um, <clears throat> I certainly like to remove any embarrassment by telling a few um, stories that embarrass me because it, it takes away the tension in the room. Um, and I, I like to discuss things that have happened to me as well, where I've had to cope afterwards and I've had to form a strategy. And also I sort of cover some of the darker stuff where I have had issues in the past mm. and then it's taken certain things to get me out of it. Um, one particular one, uh, I've, certainly I've mentioned the murder already, was my daughter. And again, how my daughter essentially dug me out of the pit of depression um, simply because she'd had enough of seeing daddy sad. Right. You know, um, I talk a lot about self-discipline. Uh, the whole day sort of starts with physical health. Okay. Because mm -hmm. when we look at, you know, how it slips across, a lot of people think that mental health problems don't affect the physical and physical health doesn't affect the mental health. Of course they do. They go hand in hand. It's a circle. Um, and if you've got staff members who are expected to perform uh, a physical task, at, at, certainly at pressure, then there has to be an element of, of physical sort of release as part of a coping strategy. Um, the interesting thing, uh, certainly working with midwives, is you get the whole demographic. You get people who are who are dedicated training half an hour a day, no matter what. Mm. And that's probably their strategy that just burns everything through. Yes. And then you get people who just walk to work and that's their exercise for the day. Mm. Um, but it's a similar thing. You know, it's a, it's a constant repetition with a goal. It's physical. Um, it's benefiting them. It's burning calories. You know, it's working the cardiovascular system. Certainly the ones that strength train is, is always a good analogy. Uh, but I'll come to that in a minute. Mm. And I think <clears throat> the interesting part is you've got to start with the physical um, and without shaming anybody as well, which is which is an interesting one, because again, you could start a guilt spiral. You could have someone go, well, I used to I used to run at school 
and here I am, 24, and I haven't run in four years while I was doing my degree. Yeah. So um, the thing there is to get them to to understand that where they are now is the starting point. Good enough is good enough, and any step forward is is a, is a good thing because they can build habits really fast. Mm. Um, and when we look at habits, certainly in dealing with behaviours, um, the interesting thing is a habit could start after two occasions where you've had a reward for it. And that reward is as simple as a little squeeze up there, a bit of dopamine to say, that's good. Got it. And the issue is when you have one bad habit, the chocolate cake, or you have a good habit, but it take, it bites into other things, so you then feel guilty for not doing it enough. Mm. You know, um, Certainly with that one, understanding good enough is good enough is, is a major part. Um, getting people to give themselves a break is a major part as well. So compassion fatigue must sort of interface with what you're talking about here in the sense that people do burn out and they do give too much and they forget to do those things that help them to get through. And the physical health is one of those. But there's also that psychological and emotional kind of wearing down that happens over time. Certainly with someone who cares, anyone who works in a caring profession um, has a, a degree of empathy, otherwise they shouldn't be there or they wouldn't be there. And what we see is that over prolonged periods of time, because they're repeating their responses to certain behaviours, uh, <clears throat> not constantly, but certainly in large periods of time, if I go on a 13-hour shift and I'm two months in, then potentially I've done 24, 13-hour shifts. And when you break it down into time scales. Mm. How many times have I helped someone go to the toilet? How many times have I dealt with someone who's irate, upset? You know, all these different factors. And before you know it, they, they stack up into large blocks of time. <clears throat> Any time you have that repet re repetition of just dealing with the same behaviours, then the potential's there for you to care from the very start and care less as time goes on because it's happening all the time. It's almost like a callus. Isn't it? Exactly. It's like a callus that yeah, it's a really good analogy. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what, what do you do to a callus? You file it down. Um, that's the, the, the thing to do if you want to keep the skin intact. Mm. But what do we see? It, it, an analogy for a behavior, certainly where someone spends a month working really hard and then goes out, say, drinking, and then poisons themselves for three days and can't get into work and stuff. That's akin to ripping the callus off. Yes, yeah. So they've got to a point where it's there and they need to do something about it. So they let off steam. And the way they do that is a, a behavior that means that then they suffer. Yeah. But physically and, you know, psychologically, because hangovers are terrible. And if you've got woulda, coulda, shoulda going around in your head while you've got a hangover, then all that's going to happen is you catastrophize the hangover, you, you attach it to what's going on in your head. And then you're on these spirals, these down days. That's not to say that you shouldn't have them because they are a natural process. But the thing is, if, if we're expecting ourselves to be professional and certainly in, in any provision of care, keep our standards high, everyone needs to understand that you will have the, the highs and the lows and they need to forgive themselves for the, the lows and they need to reward themselves for the highs. It's always, it's always an interesting thing. Um, I always find it fascinating when people talk about, oh, well, you know, work's just work. Okay. Have you had a success at work today? So what's the reward for the success? Mm. It's, it only needs to be a tiny thing, but that, that will keep you going forward. It keeps you positive, you know? Interesting. You know, just yesterday, I think you and I sort of both saw it on Facebook or on LinkedIn. We, you know, I posted this um, excerpt from Fred Lee's book about if Disney ran your hospital. Yeah, and I love that book. There's so much in it, but um, that one piece of the book is about a page of of the content. It says, you know, we we hire people and we we teach them how to be courteous and competent. But the real leaders in any space where we're delivering care are the ones who are truly compassionate. And um, and and to be compassionate, you kind of have to be inspired by something. And I think when you meet somebody who's who says, "Oh, you know, it's just work, isn't it?" You know, you you 
you feel or you sense in that person that they've lost that inspiration somehow. And it, I think it goes full circle back to what you described as a self-contract mm. and what I would probably talk about with a group as the values base off which they springboard into action. You know, what, what values are you bringing to this activity you call work? And if the values base is intact and it's not cracked or creaking or leaking, then things should be good and you have an inspired person, you know, delivering compassionate care. But I think it's really interesting your perspective on that. Certainly, self-contract is, is one way of looking at it. Goal setting is another another way, it's, another thing it's called. Um, because I'm, it's not just the negative, it's not just what I'll put up with, it's also what I want. And uh, certainly when talking about goal setting, again, early in the course, we need to we need to un get people to understand that small goals lead to large goals. You know, this kind of uh, chunking things down approach. If you want to use the NLP language, but interestingly for me, um, people t don't tend to do that. Mm. I like to I like I, I use a ladder analogy a lot. Um, both delivering any any sort of training because skill ladders work really well, and you just go up a rung and then up a rung and up a rung, and before you know it, you've climbed the ladder. Mm. Um, the interesting thing is when we look at compassion fatigue, it's the same process. They've experienced a bad behavior. Then the next shift, they experience a similar behavior. The brain is a pattern recognizing machine. So it clumps the two together. Then three shifts in, it's three. Then it's four. Then it's 10. Then it's 24. So what the brain does is it essentially goes, ah, well, this is what's going to happen all the time. And it doesn't differentiate between each time and each time. Every human interaction is unique, but they don't allow themselves to have that. And you, it's very easy. I mean, I've certainly experienced it in my own career in security to feel mired in the 3% of your, your work life, which is bad, because you let that define the whole, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that was another thing that certainly came across from the, the midwives I was training, and um, it's five years now. And the first day I was there, and that, that was a again, a real test for me because I was delivering something I've researched for just over two years um, and <laughs> standing in front of a room full of people who've essentially gone, well, if you, if you do well, then we're going to stay here. And if you don't, we're quitting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because course, they had because a 60% attrition rate. They had this. So let's just talk about that for a moment. They had this huge attrition rate with all yep. these clinicians getting really good education and mentoring for a couple of years, several years. Uh, it's a degree course. You know, it's, it's a full degree course to become a midwife because you're an independent practitioner. And then they were seeing this huge, like, drop-off in the first year or two of clinical first practice. Year. First year, 60%. My goodness. And looking at it organizationally, if, if you had an organization where 60% of your new staff left in the first year, then that would be such a massive red flag that you, you tear apart your recruitment process and, and everything involved in how you get people into the job. Um, so there was no pressure. No pressure <laughs> at all, yeah. Uh, and again, it, it, it was flipping the perspective that was the key there. Um, and I stood in front of this room full of ladies who and one gentleman who essentially were doing the, should have had this years ago, so let's see what you've got. Uh, so the expectation was very high, and at the end of the day, um, the feedback was very, very good. And at the end of the year, the rate was two percent. Their new dropout rate for new clinicians was two percent after they'd had a, a single intervention from you. A single day, yeah. Wow. Um, I think it helped on that particular on that first course to have members of line management there to have people from different departments there as well who, who, who just essentially popped in if you've ever seen a training day at a hospital you know that you know people come in and out <clears throat> at some point someone goes oh that's interesting i think i'll sit in on that yes yeah um but again perhaps it's because i don't i don't do an exclusionary attitude towards that you know oh you're here well you just come and join in and, and we the good thing for that is you also get that extra perspective. Of and course, that extra yeah. perspective is, is so important any time that you're having a discussion, which is what all training is. You know, you're, you're having a discussion and trying to lead it. And I think if you've got a senior member of hospital staff 
who, who decides to take even 20 minutes out of their day to sit in your session, there's probably a really good reason for that and it has to be respected. And if they do want to input, it's going to be important input. Absolutely. And that builds trust and, and trust between management and staff is, is one of those key things that we have to address when we look at organizations. So um, to have someone from management in on a personal resilience course was brilliant because obviously everyone's in it together and learning together. Um, I've always found it fascinating when you have two tier systems of training where management don't attend with their frontline operators or carers or whoever it is because the issue comes in that I don't trust what you've been taught because I wasn't there. They don't trust what I've been taught because they weren't there. And then you almost get a them and us, which happens. Um, on a fostering course recently, there was social workers and foster carers in the room. Um, and because it was day two of, of their training, as, as it was, they went, oh, we've developed a good them and us. And I went, well, okay, well, I'm going to break that down by the end of the day. There'll be none of that. Um, and again, a little bit of humour there, but we, we got those broken down. And different perspectives is always interesting to, to sort of mix in with that one. Um, and certainly having someone in the room who had been a midwife for 30 years say to me, well, I wish I'd had this because it would have saved me a lot of stress over the years. Um, and when I talk about stress, again, you essentially have two kinds of stress. You have the detrimental kind of stress, which eats away at you, that constant drip, drip, drip of adrenaline that, that burns you out. And then you have transformative stress. And the difference between the two is how you appraise it to yourself. It truly is. I mean, um, working with all sorts of people over the years um, and some, some people who have survived horrific things in single events or been uh, in relationships that have been abusive for in the long term, coercive or physically abusive. The thing that normally is the seed change that turns that stress from the thing that's eating them to the thing that causes them to have action and sort something out is how they see it. You know, um, it, it, certainly when we look at long-term stress, if, if, if I'm in a, a, a profession where I have passion in what I'm doing, and then I start to feel compassion fatigue, which is wearing away that passion, then I need to reframe it and re-examine why I was there, and then hopefully reignite that passion so the compassion comes back. Um, and there is also, <clears throat> it's a fascinating thing, this is the, the 2%, the two percent. because of the course, the 2%, which was one person for that intake, had reappraised and decided, this isn't for me, <clears throat> because what, what essentially is happening is my mental health is suffering, mm. and I can make a clean decision to move on and do something else. So you facilitate both sides. You can't always have it <clears throat> one way. You can, it's certainly when it comes to a, a a group of people who've spent a long time studying, which in itself is very stressful um, and places burdens on home life and you know financially and everything else. And then there has to come a time where you have to be realistic with yourself. And if that has set in, if the compassion fatigue is in and it has eaten away, then the coping strategy actually lets you inform yourself, I need to let this go now and I need to move on. Yeah, I think the... the that whole idea of the conceptual, like how to conceptualize the problem, that reframing yeah. that you talked about is so huge. And I just happened to watch a movie the other night called Moneyball. Okay. So Moneyball is a story about this um, baseball manager in the US who had a really small budget compared to all the other baseball teams that he had to, to fight against and compete against in the championship. And he and his guys all sit down one day and they wonder how they're going to try and win next year with this tiny budget. And he sits there and all the other advisors at the table say to him, well, we could do this and that's a strategy they've tried for years or we could do that and that's a strategy they've tried for years. And he sits there and he says, he goes around the table, he says, what's the problem? And he asks them over and over again what the problem is and essentially he he's reconceptualized the whole problem, which is why the movie's called Moneyball because he had to come at it from a statistical point of view. He's like, what, what we need right. aren't star players. We need players who actually get home runs and stuff like that. So it's all baseball things, which I don't really understand. But the, the key point was, 
how he conceptualized the problem allowed him to get out of that funk. You know, they're they're in this hole. They're in a really bad place. They have a problem they can't seem to solve. And then reframing the problem just really allows them to come out of that and, and move forwards. Hmm. And it's such a big thing. Um, I was thought, by the way, it was interesting you mentioned about the midwife who was, you know, who wished she had it, the, the training 30 years ago. I think you were there on the training when we have somebody come up to us and say, uh, if I'd had this training 30 years ago, I wouldn't be on my fourth husband. That's right. Yeah, remember that? Remember. Yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so we can give people these tools and uh, they take them away uh, and use some of the ideas that you've given them to just re refocus themselves and renew themselves in terms of what they're how they're seeing their work is that would that that's be that's good? the first that's the first part um mm. because the issue you then find is that once you set goals and standards and you understand that you're not going to allow yourself to slip into these patterns of behavior that are destructive then you need to move forward and the only way to move forward is to to sort of build a system uh, which is always fascinating because people resist systems for their personal life massively. But if you say to someone at work, here's a check sheet for your day, they love it because, you know, it makes it easy to have a list. So the first thing I look at is uh, is how they actually frame their day, you know. Um, interestingly, a, a lot of stuff about affirmations over the years I've been looking at and some really wild stuff as well as that's out there about you know verses and verses and verses but i think just making the decision that you know today's a good day when you open your eyes is a good thing no matter what your mood is and mood comes into it a lot because mood channels into emotion which channels into behavior but it also works the other way and uh, i talk about the workplace and how the environment has to be conducive to wanting to be there um certainly with the, the midwives i was working with having a staff room that's comfortable environment first you know um having the facility to get a drink when they need a drink i spoke to management and we were talking about how difficult it is to schedule their breaks well okay they need to get a break and the way to build the trust between you and your team is for you to make sure they get their breaks before you because they'll see you as a giving pair caring person in leadership and they'll follow they'll follow you anywhere then you know mm. um the american thing that uh, is used is uh, leaders eat last which is a, a u.s marine corps thing so at, at the queue of people at the the canteen the officers are at the very back yep. and they eat yep. last and that that does help build respect and trust um then you've got other factors going forward self-discipline uh and again as in the past, a prolific procrastinator is the phrase I like for that one. Uh, someone who can pro can procrastinate a lot, which is interesting. Um, Somebody uh, really, really, really good at, at not getting things done. Yeah. And pushing them on the long finger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could you're, be you're one of those. This, you've got great standards and rest, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, So, yeah, and I, 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 what I like to, like to do is get people to understand that the self-fulfilling prophecy um, with regards to how you're going to feel if you take one step, then another step, then another step. Um, and again, certainly with care, they can see it because they have they have literal physical examples in front of them. Certainly with the process of birthing a child, then, you know, everything that goes afterwards, it's one step after one step after one step. And it's it's small steps that lead to large changes. So that's the second thing. Um, then I ask people to look at their own sort of moral compass because uh, everything is driven by your moral compass. It's what you've decided is good for you, good for others, how much loyalty you'll place in certain relationships, certainly work relationships, home relationships, all this stuff. Um, how honest you are with yourself and others is an interesting one. Um, I had a discussion quite a while back with some mental health professionals about therapeutic lying, um, <laughs> telling a lie to achieve a therapeutic goal. And the ethics discussion around that was about 45 minutes long. It was fascinating to be part of. Yeah. Because the opinions across the room, and this was from one hospital as well, were so different and so contrary to each other that you could you could see the, the blood boiling in the room 
And certainly with some people, you know, oh, I, I never lie to anyone. I never, never, never lie to anyone. And then, of course, someone will throw that what if out. Okay, so what of if course, your mum yeah. said, you know, what if your mum said, do I look good today? And she didn't. Would you say to your mum, no, you look horrible. What if your what if your partner said, do I look good today? And she didn't. Would you be totally honest there? And, you know, so it was a really fascinating conversation, especially where it turned from about ethics of therapeutic lying into a whole broad spectrum moral discussion about honesty. I think that's really interesting. I, uh, <clears throat> I had the great honor to, to teach uh, quite a few st students at the University of Edinburgh where, you know, some of them were studying medicine. And every now and then we we just talk about how they're getting on. And, and once I can remember speaking with a, a young man who's now a, a doctor somewhere in the world. And he said that they had actually started to tell patients that the medicine they were giving them was really new, really good. It had had great results with other patients similar to them. And really selling the patient on the benefits of the medicine. And, and the reason they were doing this is that, well, the placebo effect. Mm. So if I can convince this patient that the medicine's working, then, you know, scientifically, evidentially, that is very likely to have an effect on the patient. Mm. But it trips up over that ethical question, the quandary that you just discussed. There, is there, am, am I telling them the truth? That, you know, is it? And so on. It's really interesting. It, 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 again, it, as certainly when dealing with clinicians in, in that setting, it was absolutely fascinating because uh, the end goal in, in this case was to stop a patient having uh, aggressive and violent incidents. Um, but it, it, it backfired in the end because at a certain point, people will see through a lie, and that's the issue that you have with that. Um, as long as, as long as e either you're a really good liar or you are able to smooth it in a way so that that is no longer a massive bump in trust, then you're okay. Um, I, <laughs> interestingly, for me, I came down on the necessity and proportionality line of it to add some logical framework to it, yep. um, and. And then you had people considering all sorts of different options because if it was really necessary to save a life and it was proportionate to the threat which was their behaviour becoming so bad they harm themselves or others, then what's the problem in a fib was the general sort of consensus. You know, as long as it's not going to have a long-term effect on trust for the staff. And, yeah. you know, I, I found that fascinating because they, they still caveat. And you do that with yourself. That's the interesting thing with resilience. You caveat yourself with your own social, uh, with your own self contract. You will accept a certain behaviour from one person because they are a loved one, but never accept it from someone else. Mm. So you, you you caveat your own contracts when it comes to your your personal interactions with people, and that's always fascinating as well because there's an ethical framework behind that. Definitely, yeah. And again, it. If if I've set a standard for myself and then I have exceptions to that standard, then I've got to justify it. Otherwise, I will feel hypocritical, guilty. You know, so that that's the other thing is getting people to framework things so they can understand what's going on, and then diminish. You can't ever take it away totally, but diminish this effect of feeling bad afterwards, mm. or regret, or guilt, or. The, one of the worst ones is when someone feels like they're a hypocrite because they're embarrassed to themselves, which is an interesting um, sort of concept. Yes. Yeah. Because embarrassment in the normal framework is in front of other people. But you can be embarrassed in yourself, as in you feel ashamed for your behavior, but no one else is here to see it because you, you set a standard, you've broken it, and then you accept it. Getting rid of that self-embarrassment is a key. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, um, I'm a big fan of this guy, uh, Robert Cialdini. So he has written extensively about persuasion. Yeah. And one of the things that you can trigger in somebody to, to help them to go along with a one particular option or another is you trigger their internal consistency. Mm. So if they've decided that they're a certain type of person or they've decided that they're going with a certain brand or they've decided on a certain cause of action, course of action, then uh, if you can trigger them to think about how consistent they are with themselves, mm. 
then they'll probably go along with whatever's consistent, whatever they've previously decided, whatever they see themselves as, or whatever they identify themselves with. So that that self embarrassment, that hypocrite uh, problem, is that inconsistency with myself, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And again, you know, um, when we look at team dynamics, which is the last sort of part of the day, we look at interpersonal support and everything else that goes. At, being a cog in a machine, as it were, which is a horrible analogy because it's humans, but you know where I'm going with that. Mm. And the thing I find fascinating about that is, again, famous Joel Ashley phrase, all behavior equalizes. Yes. Um, so unless you've got a team of people who, are, who have the same goals, who have a similar sort of mindset when they arrive at work, and then if someone does arrive out of that mindset, interpersonal support kicks in so it gets dealt with, either by people at one level or moving up the chain, and dealt with in a way that's not a punishment exercise, but is a fix the problem exercise. You know, I'm a massive a fan of fix the problem, not the blame. And mm. uh, again, horror, thousands of sound bites in a 10 minute conversation, but you know, fix the problem, not the blame, means that people don't feel guilty for getting something sorted out. Whereas certainly you see management styles, and this is across the board, not just in healthcare, where the problem can't be fixed until someone is blamed. Mm -hmm. And all that does is make people feel bad, that spirals, and then you're going to get all sorts of issues with people and their mental health purely going forward because they have made themselves feel bad because there's a problem that needed to be fixed. And people feel great about fixing problems. I mean, as human beings, it, it it ticks all the buttons, right? You see a problem, you fix it, you know. Well, again, the sense of achievement you get from fixing something, for, for solving that issue, um, that's the reward. That's the first reward is that little bit of dopamine that says you did good today. Um, and it's getting that acceptance that that's my reward and I want that to repeat. I want it to keep going and form a habit. And then past the habit become a routine. Because once you get to that stage where something is a routine, then it's baseline behavior. And it's something that you want all the time, you know, as, as a norm, as it were. Um, and normal is a horrible phrase, but baseline is what we're after. So towards the end of the day, you're talking with the, the team about how they work with each other. And, and that's, that's sort of how you then leave it with them as a program that they work with each other on. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of the idea of getting people to email themselves a reminder um, because that way you, you essentially set a, a long-term memory trigger that's going to, oh yeah, we did that course last week and there was this. Um, and that's a, that's a useful tool as a trainer. Uh, but also what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get them to see a, a dynamic and then we have to cover the toxic people that you're going to encounter um, and that includes patient service users, clients, um, all the way through to management, uh, other staff, and how dealing with toxic people is an essential part of your, your well-being. So essentially, it's a very short conflict management course, Okay. but it's goal-focused. It's about keeping people on goal, you know, not trying to change their behavior. Um, if I've got a, let's say I'm the midwife booking someone in, then I'm seeing them at, at month three and it's 25 minutes to half an hour or maybe 45 minutes. And I may not see them again in, until six months time. Yeah. But if I don't set a standard right there of, of accepted behavior and social contract and, and, and get that understanding, then what's going to happen in the time in between in the appointments with other members of staff? And again, it's all on record. So you, you could look, you could have a member of staff look back and go, who booked him in? Oh, yeah, she never talks to anyone about it. And though, right. dealing with those sorts of issues is, is fascinating for me because in a team dynamic, you want a level playing field that's led by someone exceptional at the task. Yep. Yeah. And then because of their example, then you match their behavior. Um, and if someone comes in, to that team dynamic, so shift change is, is the most common thing we'd look at, yes. or start start of work, then it needs to be dealt with immediately. And everyone has bad days. The issue is people are made to feel bad about having a bad day. Mm. 
Whereas the constructive thing to do is to gain some, some support straight away, bolster confidence, set the goal, and then move forward together. Because everyone has a life, everyone has bad days. Um, but I, I find this blaming thing the worst bit about it. You know, If I've had a bad day and you make me feel bad for having a bad day, then that's a double bad day. Of course, yeah. And I think, you know, uh, having observed that dynamic where that negative spiral starts in a few workplaces, you know, there's nothing worse than where that becomes normal and, and, yeah. and people complain about each other. And then all of a sudden, you're going back to the thing you discussed before is that us and them. So that yeah. then, you, then you've got vertical conflict and horizontal conflict. And at that point, everything's broken and we really do need some kind of intervention to get this whole thing reset you know we need to reset the social contract we need to decide how we're going to treat each other um, and how we're going to treat our clients and visitors and maybe you know re just re renew the relationships and the way we're going to treat each other in, in, the, in the setting so important absolutely so, i've got a question for you then just to close things out which is wh where do you see Obviously, you've worked with clinicians um, in the NHS and, and with you know, people involved in that setting. Where do you see your personal resiliency course going? Uh, so <clears throat> the, the key to me is to be able to get it delivered to as many, many people as possible so that they remain caring in their caring professions. Um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff we've been talking about recently about compassion fatigue is that... <clears throat> unless you give people a, a skill set to start the process of letting themselves keep on, keep hold of their compassion, then we're going to see it more and more. And for me, the whole point is to get it out there, not just clinicians, everyone who needs it. Um, I had an interesting conversation with someone who works in retail during the day, uh, the other night, and uh, she was saying that she has two jobs. She works a bar and she works in retail. And the abuse she gets in the bar setting doesn't affect her at all but the abuse she gets in the retail setting does affect her and uh, it's purely based on the context and the work environment the team dynamic when she's on the bar is one where she's able to use humor to brush off incidents that would normally affect her but the serious nature of the retail environment means that everything is said is taken seriously so you have this 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 dichotomy of one work environment is humorous and fun so therefore things don't stick the other one is really serious and prim and proper. And then everything that's said sticks. Every tiny curse word, everything that's outside of social contract hits her really hard. Mm. And uh, I, I had a little time with her to talk about reframing. And then I talked about interpersonal support with her. And she said, there is none. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, oh, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, because... Certainly, when we look at an organization's success, you want your staff to be happy because they'll be passionate in their job. When we look at care, we want compassion to continue throughout a career. So the only way to do that is to give people the strategy that lets them enjoy what they do and stop things that are bad sticking. Very good. Brilliant. Well, uh, that's a really good introduction to your course. So thanks for that. Um, no, no doubt we'll dig into some of those topics in more detail some other time. Mm -hmm.